First of all, I, I'd like to say it's a great honor to be with you. Um, for the question, it's very interesting. I have to say it's very particular in China's situation. When I was at the university studying, um, at that time, Chinese law schools were not yet open. Because you know, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, law schools uh, are not yet available for, for us. But during the Cultural Revolution, I saw with my own eyes that we need law for the construction of our own country. So I became very interested in law. Then since I studied foreign uh, languages, foreign literature, I, I was also very interested in international relations. So I pick up international law as my interest. So my interest in international just grow from there. And it so happened upon my graduation, um, law schools, was resumed and uh, international law courses um, were offered at the time. But uh, already I started my work in foreign service and because of my interest I was assigned to the legal department and then I studied with uh, the legal counsels who later became the judge at the International Court of Justice, Judge Ni was my first mentor. And then I studied international at the Peking University Legal School. So that's how I started with the career. I think the most um, biggest challenges for the world is really the changing international relations. Uh, in the past, we have a relatively simple relations between states. Now you have a much players on the world stage. And uh, uh, interdependency between states, peoples, and exchanges between countries and peoples are tremendous, especially with the information technology, uh, great progress of the transportation, science technology. Today it's really indeed a small world. And what we can do as international lawyers to promote a, a really international a global governance on the basis we can really take care of the interests of the people. It's really a big challenge. So the whole thing, um, the structure is being challenged. This, I think this is the, the time we have to think hard about international law and its future. The court can prove itself as a reliable forum mm -hmm. for peaceful settlement of international disputes. As you know, the jurisdiction of the court is based on the principle of consent. It's a consensual basis for the court's jurisdiction. So how could you um, persuade states to come to the court whenever they have a dispute between them? Um, so when people say, oh, the court does not have many cases, we have to say we are only stay at the receiving end. We cannot control states. But uh, on the other hand, when each time when I see a dispute being settled by the court and the parties feel um, quite happy uh, with the result, I feel very much rewarded. Um, we should have heavy responsibility, but at the same time, we also see many other forums coming up. Uh, some people consider them as a challenge to the court. Um, and also, general international law may not no longer be considered as really the most 
prominent area because people often say, oh, what kind of uh, criminal yet, you know, persecuting now, take us as uh, ICC. So people apparently have more interest in criminal court rather than in international court. I, I was uh, surprised uh, many times. Um, but uh, um, apparently uh, the court has to uh, move forward with more reforms uh, to convince things to come over. We have just celebrated our 70th anniversary and uh, we feel that uh, there's still room for us to push forward our work. And uh, of course, uh, the, the case law does not depend on our own will, but I think our work can convince states to come over. We have uh, exchange programs mm -hmm. in the legal field with uh, some uh, American universities and also the legal department has some programs with Columbia University. So this is one forum. Um, well, you still have to go back to the time when I first started my legal training. And at that time, uh, of course, we send students both to the United States and to uh, Europe. Uh, but I just had opportunity to go to Columbia. That's, that's it. And it's not an, any particular choice. We don't have much choice to make. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something we, we just uh, they made available to us. And uh, I was one of the young staff. So I think I'm quite lucky. Um, in a way, yes. Of course, it's different. Judicial work is different from the Office of Legal Advisor. Um, there, of course, you have to understand your foreign, pol foreign policy. Uh, you have to follow the guidance of the foreign policy. Uh, but here, no, you are an independent judge. And you judge on the merits according to international law, and um, this uh, is quite uh, different. But uh, I have to emphasize what I did before I came to court helped him a lot uh, in understanding the factual background, the application of the law in my work in the court. Without those experiences, I don't think I can uh, really handle the cases as well as I'm doing now. Uh, I'm doing now. Uh, it's important for international lawyer, uh, just as for any judge or jurist, you have to have a practical experience. You have to understand the essence of the application of the law in real life. And um, we often say international law is not a simply a given body of rules and obligations. They have to be applied in a certain context. For that the particular context, you really have to have knowledges beyond the law, international relations, international economics, and uh, many other things. So your practical experience will enrich your understanding of international law in handling cases on the court. I think that's uh, mutually beneficial and it's necessary to have those backgrounds. Me, I, I work with male, male colleagues all my life. I, I tell this story many times to other people. Whenever I'm sitting in a room, somebody says, Oh, finally we have a lady here. And I look around and say, oh, Where is she? I can't see it myself. But I know, uh, as you mentioned just now, for a long time, legal profession was not supposed for women. Um, Diplomatic career was not supposed for 
women either. So I entered into two wrong fields at the same time. So you can see the challenge. But uh, I have to say, when you are really in the field, the first thing you have to forget is your gender. Because you can't expect people to value your performance or your work on the basis of your gender. Say, oh, because you're a woman, this is your standard. Because he is a man, this is his standard. No. The standards remain the same, but the efforts for you means double. Because you not only have to work on an equal footing with your male colleagues, you also have to shoulder your family responsibilities as well. And also in your career, you may, as a woman, come across situation time again where you were discriminated and your words were not taken seriously simply because you're a woman. When some men repeat them, they immediately recognize them. So what can you do? Just keep doing. Take it calmly. But of course, Oftentimes, uh, those things really set you thinking and can frustrate you really hard. Um, this is uh, something I think as we are all women jurists, we have to be prepared to face it. When we first entered international commission, interesting enough, the first year, at the end of the session, we were supposed to open our report. Some male colleagues were so kind uh, that they recommend to add one paragraph uh, recognizing the contributions Paula and I made to the commission. Some other colleagues say, why should we make that? Hmm? Because we could sound very condescending. So they had very, we had a very long discussions on that paragraph. So finally, I, I felt I had to say something. I said, we were very grateful to colleagues for their very kind consideration about it. But Apollo and I, we were elected to the law commission not because of our gender, but because of our merits. So I can understand why you want to recognize our contribution, but I would recommend the commission not to make a particular reference to the two women members. You don't have to make that difference. So this is a kind of a episode you may come across again and again in your life. Don't take it personally, but take it as a women's cause. You just have to keep pushing and doing the best you can. I think gradually our male colleagues would understand our mentality, would understand our cause, and share our cause. Because as I said, success of women's cause depends on women's, uh, men's support, men's understanding. So this is uh, something we have to uh, be the bridge, you know, try to make the whole society realize. When you have women, liberation, emancipation, empowerment, the society can only become better. I think for a long time, starting with from the Western country, you call it affirmative action. Um, some cases proved successful, some did not. So it's really uh, people are giving second thought as well we should do, promote women. Uh, affirmative action may not be successful. Glass ceiling still exists. So how can you break the glass ceiling? Well, not do too much with affirmative action if that's not really effective or is not really right. Um, so um, 
for women to cause, you, you have to um, look at it, each specific case as what to do. But under any circumstances, you, people have to keep in mind there is a gender issue we should pay attention to. Because you can't simply cover this, oh, no more affirmative action. They just don't work. You can't simply push them aside. You still have to address gender issue in an affirmative way. But as how to do it depends on each case. I, I can't identify any one particular figure. But I have to say, you can easily identify a group of women lawyers who have made a great contribution to the development internationally. You can find them in the developed world as well as in development. It's, it, it will not be fair to only pin point on one person. I would say uh, with the women's movement, you see a group of young, old women lawyers who keep doing with such dedication and perseverance. Um, you can see a lot of uh, scholarly works as well as promising, uh, very prominent uh, practitioners. Uh, the cause is a collective effort. It's a collective so, um, I, when I read your question, I feel it's difficult to say one name. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a common cause. And uh, one thing I would uh, remind you is when you talk about women cause, you also have to see people who support women's cause, male and female. That's very important. Uh, we tend to um, make things in an extreme, uh, in an extreme way, as if it's only women's cause can only be done by women. That's not really true. For instance, if without my husband's support, I can't see how can we reach this far. I would say, think that international law used to be a matter for states. Now it's a matter for peoples. So whoever in the field should try its best part for a better world. And for women in particular, because women, children, they often consider as a vulnerable group. So we already in this field, we should do much better and do more for, for them and speak for them. This is 